What's up, gangsters? It is time for another one of those two-part build review kind of things. And this one is a little bit of a departure for me. Um, not because um, it's a completely crazy subject, but just because it gets into an area of aircraft modeling that I haven't explored yet. And that is more modern jets. I have gradually sort of been working my way that direction with a ME-262 and then an F-86, and now it's time for the F-4, and specifically the Hasegawa 148th scale F-4E, as you can see right here. I would show you the box lid, but it's full of stuff and you don't care about that anyway. So, this thing has been uh, uh, one of those things that uh, I didn't really plan to get into. Um, back in the spring, Jimmy D proposed to the uh, denizens of the Scale Modelers Critique Group that we do an F4 buddy build. Um, any F4 kit, any scale, any country, whatever you want. Just as long as it was a Phantom. And I was like, man, yeah, that sounds pretty cool, but I had plenty of other things on my plate. And even though I love the F4, I mean, look, the F4 is kind of like Bacon and the Clint Eastwood movies. If you don't like them, you need to step right down the hall here and the nice ladies will let you turn in your man card, right? I mean, F4s are just cool. But I don't really know a whole lot about them. I mean, as much as I think they're awesome, I've never really studied them. And so I just wasn't really that into it. Um, I wasn't going to run right out like a lot of these guys, and buy an F4 kit and get started. But, as it happens, one day um, in uh, like August, I think it was, I made the mistake of Googling F4s just because I wanted to see, you know, what was there and I had some time to kill. <laughs> and there it was. The photograph. I It was... It was love at first sight. I immediately knew that was the F4 I wanted to marry. <laughs> it uh, was a beautiful picture of a QF4E, which if you're not familiar, the QF4s were a group of phantoms that were taken out of retirement in the 90s and turned into drones. And some of them were basically destined to be blown out of the sky by... Uh, fighter jocks doing target practice, and some of them were designed to be uh, built as flying research platforms, and in fact contracted out uh, by the Air Force, uh, even to other countries who wanted to test, you know, radars and sensors and things like that. And so they got put through lots and lots of use, and this particular photograph was of a QF-4 that had just been beat to hell. And, of course, I love that kind of thing because it just had so much character. And um, it was actually uh, a photograph taken during the Phantom Farewell flight, all, of course, spelled with PHs, um, that took place last December 2016 at Holloman Air Base in Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is just right down the road from me. And so... I thought that was kind of cool, and the fact that it was from the last flight, uh, you know, the last operational moment of the Phantoms, and uh, such a neat looking aircraft, and mostly such a huge weathering and painting challenge. I just couldn't resist. So, anyway, that's why right now I have sitting on my, on my workbench here, the Hasegawa kit. And so, uh, the purpose of this video is going to be to basically check out the kit and uh, and all of the uh, aftermarket event adventures that I'm going through with it. So, with all that, let's take a look. Okay, so, <laughs> as you can see, um, this box of stuff is in quite a bit of disarray because I've been working pretty hard on this thing, um, and there's plenty to talk about. But, first, let's uh, see if we can make some sense out of all of this by first taking a quick look at the instruction sheet, as usual. Now, there are a bunch of versions of Hasegawa's F-48. 
Uh, so <laughs> F48. Wow, that was a that was a slip. F4E in 148 scale. Um, there are um, more than I can count or, or even know or, or understand, um, and they encompass all kinds of specific varieties and variations and versions and all that stuff. And there's a very specific reason that I bought this one, which I'll go into in a minute. But basically, uh, it comes down to some specific plastic bits that I needed for my QF4E, because nobody really makes a kit of a QF4 that I know of. Anyway, as most of you I'm sure know, the two main F4E or F4 kits in 148 that people go for are either this one or the Academy kit. And um, I, I understand there are plenty of differences, so I'm not going to really attempt to compare them, but just uh, kind of show you what's up with this one. Zuki Mura has now come out with their own, which looks to be pretty cool, and it addresses a lot of the things that uh, you'll see in this kit. Anyway, this thing is fairly simple. Uh, it's a 90s, late 90s, or maybe early 2000s vintage kit. Um, let's see if there's actually a date on this instruction sheet. I don't see one right off the bat, but anyway, this thing has been around for a while. But it is a very good quality kit overall in terms of the, uh, the molding and the fit and the detail. It reminds me a lot of my Hasegawa F86 kit that I built earlier this year. The detail is not super stout, but what is there is crisply molded and um, it'll get, you know, it gets you a long way down the road. So if you wanted to build this thing straight out of the box, you'd have a pretty cool result. But as we will see, there are also a plethora of aftermarket options for the thing. And uh, I wanted to get into all of that. So anyway, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. You're just gonna, you know, do the usual thing, build the cockpit, stuff it in the fuselage, glue the halves together, add some wings and some landing gear, and then a whole bunch of stuff underneath. And bam, you've got an F4. Uh, they've got several different color layouts in here. They do the usual good job of, you know, spelling all that out for you, giving you good color callouts. Um, and they give you a nice chart that uh, tells you all about the possible ordnance options and loadouts and station numbers and things. So that's pretty cool. It's a little bit of a new thing for me since I haven't built a jet this modern yet if you can call a vintage, uh, well, a Vietnam vintage jet modern. Um, anyway, oh, here we go. This instruction sheet was printed in Japan in 1998, so that gives you some idea. Um, but, uh, you, you know, this is all pretty straightforward, uh, like I would expect from just about everything I've done from Hasegawa. The only exception being when I built their 132nd scale Mustang, which is literally one of the worst kits in the history of model kits. Anyway, so um, let's start taking stuff out of this box and having a look at what all we've got here. Um, there's plenty of stuff. I really wanted the complete modern jet aftermarket experience. So, as you'll see, we've got lots to talk about. Basically everything but wheelbase because in another departure from my normal thing, I am building this one in flight. So, um, this was actually kind of a perfect way for me to do this. In a way, it's like the perfect thing for the lazy jet modeler because the QF birds had virtually no markings on them. All their insignia and, and stencils and everything were faded out and worn off. So I have basically no decals to apply, just a few in things to mask and paint in terms of markings. I'm building it in flight, so that means that I don't have to deal with any landing gear. I don't have to worry too much about the... Uh, uh, insides of the cockpit, uh, or, or at least not as much as I would if the, if the thing was going to be open. I don't have to deal with multi-piece canopy because 
One great thing about this kit is that it comes with both the multi-piece canopy for those building it open and a single piece canopy if you're building it shut. It does not come with all of these dead bugs, I should point out. Those are details you have to add yourself and you do that by just leaving it sitting on the shelf open all through the summer. <laughs> anyway, here we go. You can see uh, the parts are pretty straightforward. One thing I like is that the horizontal stabilizers are single piece, so you don't have to join any halves. They've uh, molded them on both sides for you. One thing that you see immediately with those though is that this kit, like uh, other Hasegawa uh, aircraft kits, doesn't have any riveting detail to speak of. There is a little bit in a few select areas, but for the most part, you don't get any rivets. And I, I regretted not riveting my F-86, and so that's been a big part of this project. And you can see that I've got these drawings from the trusty old interwebs that have all of the rivets called out. And I've been, as, you'll, as I'll show you, I've just been gradually working my way through all of those with my Rosie the Riveter rivet wheels. Anyway, uh, here is lots of stuff that I also won't use other than the centerline fuel tank. This is all the ordnance and the nozzles, which I will not be using. You can see that they are pretty devoid of detail. I mean, it can't get a whole lot more basic than that. The wheels, uh, which I wouldn't be using one way or the other, uh, are also pretty basic in, in detail. Um, you know, not terrible, but nothing special. So, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, now, when we get to the next sprue, we get to see a lot more of the detail parts. All right, if I can get all this untangled. So, here we have things like the instrument panels, which you can see, again, are Pretty straightforward. I mean, they're respectably molded and the detail is fine. Again, nothing that you're gonna really write home about, but that you can certainly turn into a good result if you choose to use those. Same thing with the landing gear. Not too bad. You can see the Martin Baker ejection seat is molded in uh, uh, four or five separate pieces where you've got the sides then you've got the uh, ejection pulls and all of that. And then here is the cockpit, uh, cockpit floor. Yes, this kit comes with a cockpit floor, <laughs> little inside joke there. Um, and again, the detail is fine and crisp and not too bad. Certainly acceptable if you were going to do a closed canopy. But like I said, I wanted the full aftermarket experience. So. Um, I chose to, uh, to, to purchase all of that stuff, and I'll show that to you here in a second. Um, you can see you get a couple of pilots, and, you know, for 148th scale, not too terrible. Um, I have already completed the assembly and painting of Captain Paul E. Styrene, who is the jet jock in this case, and there he is. So you can see, not too bad. I mean, it's it's not the best figure that you'll get at any scale, but it's certainly acceptable. Okay, so going back to this sprue for a second, you can see most of the kit is recessed panel lines. You get some raised ones here on the uh, outsides of the intakes, but those also are gonna be replaced, as will these parts, even though they're really nice looking and very crisply molded. The ramps right here, you can see that's really nice, crisp detail. And again, that's what I would expect from Hasegawa. Um, you know, most of their relatively new kits are, are, are of a similar level of quality and, and can be built into very nice models. Um, okay, so sorting through all the dead bugs and so forth, you can see the nose is two pieces. Um, Nothing special really about that. Uh, okay, let's see. Now, 
got an Edward mask set, which I will be using, obviously, for the closed canopy. And then you can see down here uh, the decal sheet um, and all of the markings that you get with that. Um, you get the slime light decals, uh, which I will not be using, as I'll, I'll show you why. Uh, and then all of the uh, the rest of the stuff. Um, and I think there must be a separate decal sheet around here somewhere for all of the stencils because I know this isn't all of them. F4s are infamous for having like hundreds of the things, which fortunately, like I said, I don't have to use. So anyway, that's all of the basic uh, kit bits. And if I can managed to get this photo etch fret off the bottom of the box here. We'll take a look at the aftermarket bits. Oh, for goodness sakes. Okay, there we go. All right, now, this is from the Edward basic, uh, wait, no, sorry, not Edward. I'm about to misspeak. This came with the Aries set. So let's, let me get uh, here, let me, Pack all this stuff back up and move this box out of the way and we'll start talking about uh, aftermarket stuff. Uh, I will say that so far, even though I haven't done a whole lot of assembly, um, I mean basically the wings and the fuselage halves are the only things that I've put together so far. The fit's been good. I mean, exa again, exactly what I would expect from Hasegawa, nothing, nothing major. Uh, all of this stuff went together fine. Um, and again, the detail is pretty good. There um, is one sort of beef that I have, and that is that these uh, doors right here are molded open rather than giving you the option. And there's been some considerable argument about those uh, doors on Scale Modeler's Critique Group. What those are is they're called engine bay bypass doors. And what they do is they relieve overpressure inside the fuselage from bypass air. If you know much about jet engines, you know that they have air that goes through them and that air that goes around them. And the air that goes around them performs a cooling function for the most part. And it's called bypass air. Anyway, these doors are set up to where they open, as far as we can understand, at um, about um, anything over standard atmospheric pressure, about 14 PSI. So that can happen, that essentially happens only at really low speeds or when like the aircraft is landing or on the ground. So if the aircraft is on the ground, they are uh, they can be either open or closed, but apparently are most often open. And you will rarely see them open in flight. I do have one picture of an F4 at high altitude uh, where you can see that the doors are open. So given the hassles of fixing them shut and all of that that I didn't really want to screw around with, and the fact that this aircraft is being photographed in a low speed pass, I decided, yeah, they could be open. Yeah, I'm leaving them. <laughs> That's my story, I'm sticking to it. Now, um, also you can see that I've got all of the gear doors glued in place and they fit fairly well. I almost didn't have to do any, any work to, uh, to make them look good. Um, but I wasn't totally satisfied. The gaps around the edges were not perfectly even, so I chose to scribe all the way around the doors, and that ended up being a lot of work, um, and, and around the air brakes too, which are separate pieces. Um, I had to do a little bit of filling with liquid sprue, um, it just different places where I, I had to do that kind of work to make the outline of everything look consistent. The uh, speed brakes here, uh, or sorry, not the speed brakes, but the flaps, flapperons, whatever you want to call them, have a join line that runs all the way along here, which wasn't too bad, but I filled it in and rescribed it, again, using liquid sprue. Um, but, you know, again, overall, the fit is pretty good, and you don't have to do any of the stuff that I did to make a decent result. Like, for example, these little pieces right here, uh, I didn't do anything to clean up the fit around those. And you can see that they are pretty good. Now, 
This gizmo right here is the reason why I chose this particular boxing of the Hasegawa kit. That is called a Tiseo pod or Tiseo pod. I don't know how you say it, but it's T-E-S-E-O. And that's some kind of an acronym that means, you know, extra top secret electronic gizmo on the wing. This boxing includes it in the sprues, but doesn't uh, call for it to be installed in the instruction sheet. But it is definitely on the bird that I am modeling. What also was not uh, included on here that's on my bird are some of these little protuberances on the wingtips. If it'll focus for me, you can see that square thing out there on the edge and then those little whatever they are on the trailing edge. I just made those using a little bit of evergreen. So anyway, that covers all of the wing stuff. Uh, let me put this box away and I will talk about talk about fuselage stuff. So the fuselage is where most of the action has been happening. As you can see, I've got my two halves glued together, um, extra super strong with some acrylic and super glue inside there because I knew I was going to be wrestling this thing around a lot. And uh, that represented the first challenge, which was uh, taking care of the seam uh, on the top of the fuselage spine. Um, if you look at pretty much any drawing of an F4, you'll see that there are these little circular hatches along the, the way here. There's this little door on F4Es, uh, which are Air Force only, uh, for the refueling probe that has to be taken care of. So anyway, there's quite a bit of, uh, of detail that crosses that panel line joint that had to be rescribed. And I actually ended up rescribing these little circular things a couple of times because, uh, you know, they're just tricky to get uh, consistent where I liked them. Um, but, you know, overall, again, pretty pretty basic rescribe and re-rivet stuff. Uh, you can see that I've got a couple of rows of rivets running the length of the thing here. And those are all rivets that are not molded in. Something else that's not included is this sort of stretched out football shaped lump right there. And that is some type of an antenna, I'm told. And I needed that, so I added that on there. Also, uh, uh, this thing here on top of the, of the uh, vertical stabilizer I had to add. And then back here, there is an antenna sticking out and I've added a little uh, mount for that. Now, technically, this cylindrical thing here is not correct for the F4E, um, at least not the one I'm building, but it's pretty close. And two mics used to make a resin version of that, but apparently you can't get it anymore. And I just decided that it was close enough and that I was going to just live with it. So anyway, that's all of the, the stuff that's been going on with the outside of the fuselage. Lots of basic body work. Um, not that anything didn't fit well, it's just that, like I you know, talked about with this spine seam, just stuff that had to be dealt with. Um, a lot of time spent on the re-riveting. You can see, hopefully there, um, lots of rivets running up and down the sides of the fuselage, um, both the upper and lower part. And then I've come to the next big challenge on the external surfaces of the fuselage and that's back here on the heat shield. Now all that Hasegawa gives you back here are these uh, fairly deeply molded and slightly larger rivets than you get everywhere else and hopefully I can there we go that should that should make it where you can see them. Anyway, all they are is just deep rivets. And if you've looked at any close-up pictures of this area of an F4, you know that all of those fasteners have these large flat washers on them. They're like an inch or an inch and a half in diameter, and they definitely are characteristic of, of that part of the F4. And Academy has, has done a good job of molding those in as basically little recessed circles. So anyway, I ended up with the Hasegawa kit, which might not have been the best thing in retrospect because I wanted an F4E and apparently Academy doesn't make one. And so I didn't have much choice. 
but to deal with this back here. And so I've been on a mission to find a good solution for how to produce those large uh, washers that are around each one of those fasteners. And as you can see here, I've been experimenting with both embossing them. Um, the embossed ones there, I made a little tool where I've got a piece of brass tubing that's got a perfectly tight uh, sewing needle inside of it. Um, and that should have worked to allow me to properly center the tool and cut that outline so that everything was concentric. But it just didn't work great. I tried doing it with the beading tool freehand and that was a disaster. There's just no way to make sure that they're all perfectly spaced and aligned. So that wasn't gonna work and you can see what the result with my little tool that I made there was. They center up okay, but not perfectly and I just, I don't know. I just didn't feel like the result was crisp enough. So what I have here are a couple of different experiments with punching uh, discs. And those are one millimeter diameter styrene discs out of 5000 evergreen sheet there on the left side where I punched them, glued them obviously with extra thin, which is great because then they're basically part of the structure and they can be warded around as much as I want to to get them into the right spacing and alignment. So, um, and then I sanded them down because five thousandths was still too thick. So those are maybe two thousandths tall at that point. And then I just went and embossed the, uh, the rivet as close to the center as I could. But I showed the guys on SMCG and as expected, they were like, well, but what if you did it this way? Cause those look kind of thick and blah, blah, blah. So they got me trying some different types of foil. And what I have there uh, on the right hand side are a couple of discs punched out of two thousandths thick aluminum foil and glued on with gator grip, which that kind of gets into the pros and cons of, of doing it either way. Um, it's nice to be able to use extra thin and know that those things are on there forever and that if I need to sand them or do anything with them, they're fine. The aluminum ones are nice. They're already the right thickness. Uh, but they have a little bit of a fringe on them from the punch and die. And uh, I've already found out the hard way that is, you know, gator grip is fine as long as you're not doing anything to them. I knocked one off while I was uh, embossing the, uh, the center rivet in there. So I don't know. I haven't decided yet which way I'm going to go. But the bottom line is I've got to do about 100 of them to take care of all of them in this uh, heat shield area. So... It's, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a, of a task. Anyway, you can also see that I have hogged out a bunch of material under here uh, so that I can make room for the Aries resin nozzles, which I'll show you, the intakes, which I got from Cutting Edge, and yes, the cockpit will still slide in. The front part of the fuselage is not glued together yet, so I've got a little bit of slack there. So let's take a look at those aftermarket parts. This is the photo etch from the Aries set uh, that you need for uh, seat belts and uh, canopy rails and all of that type stuff. And hey, it's brass photo etch. It's fine. It all looks pretty good. It's a little bit of a bummer that the ejection pulls are flat, but especially underneath a plastic canopy, you know, if they're well painted, that's not going to show up too much. So that's not, not a huge big deal. The Aries cockpit is beautifully detailed. Um, you can see I've got it all painted up here. And you can see that, that the level of detail that you get in there is just much, much better than what you would get with the, uh, with the, with the molded parts. And for me, being lazy on this one, it's kind of a cool thing that there is no back seat. Uh, so... Didn't have to do that. Just did a little bit of weathering in there to uh, represent where the seat used to was. Uh, you can see I've already got the rear instrument panel in place. Um, and that's a photo etch part that you have to do a little bit of painting to um, to get it to look right. Uh, and you can see I've just got the seat sitting in there loosely. But you can see the detail on the seat 
is equally as good as everything else in this cockpit. Now, uh, oh, in fact, here I still have the other seat uh, sitting out here, so you can see what I mean. I mean, the detail on that is, is really nice. And it should be for the 50 odd dollars that you pay for this Aries uh, detail set. You can see there the instrument panel all looks pretty good. Um, I think, if I remember right, that there's a piece of acetate sandwiched in there that gives you the uh, dial faces. And um, so that all looks pretty bueno. Anyway, so yeah, you pay as much for the aftermarket Aries resin detail set as you do for the entire kit to begin with, which is not, you know, too unusual in, in the uh, world of model making. And the detail is really, you know, what you're paying for and you get your money's worth there. But where you don't get your money's worth from Aries, and this I, I've discovered is a pretty common complaint with a lot of people who use their stuff is, number one, the instructions just suck. I mean, come on, guys. This is the entirety of the instruction sheet that you get for the Aries resin set. And, and uh, look, I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward. You shouldn't need to be a, a, you know, a rocket surgeon to figure it out. But it's little things like where it here it just says reduce. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't even begin to cover the drama that goes on when you start trying to make this cockpit set fit inside this fuselage. You don't just have to remove the molded in sidewall detail that's in here. You end up removing a tremendous amount of material. If you look, you can see it's, obviously you can't see what it was like, but trust me, those cockpit sidewalls are very thin now as a result of all the material that I had to sand and scrape off the insides there to make this thing fit. And I'm really glad that I'm not doing the wheel wells because my understanding is that it's very, very difficult to get enough clearance for the wheel well insert that goes in here to fit between the bottom of the fuselage and the bottom of the Aries uh, cockpit. So bullet dodged there. And then you have the uh, same thing for the nozzles. Again, they're straightforward, so you don't need a whole lot more detail about how to assemble the nozzles. Um, where are they? I've already started doing a little bit of work. I've got these pieces primed. Um, so you can see a little bit of the detail on the nozzles. I mean, it's crisp, it's nice, looks good, straightforward, so no real complaints there. But you don't have a whole lot of, uh, of mounting uh, hardware or location aids. So stuffing them in there is a little bit going to be a little bit about engineering some of that in place so that they stick out of here at the, at the proper angle. But that's the material that had to be removed in order to do that. Now, this other huge chunk of material that got taken out of the bottom of the fuselage is for these cutting edge resin uh, intakes. And that's so that you get seamless intakes yeah, because yeah, you can shine a flashlight down inside there and see the seams uh, in the injection molded uh, parts. Now, these are nice. Uh, they have recessed panel lines, so that's good. I've got a little box that I have to add right here to the side of this one for my version. Um, but these parts are, are really nice resin parts. Um, they seem to be really well molded. Um, and you can see there with the intake ramps, kind of what you've got going on. They look pretty good. I think, you know, just about as good as, as what uh, you saw on the kit parts. And then this is the front face of the turbines. And that's all one piece which helps to position everything because you can see this is kind of profiled for the inside of the fuselage shape. So, uh, and, these, and these resin parts seem to fit pretty well. 
Um, I've already test fitted everything and they seem like they're going to go in there without uh, a whole lot of drama. And the cutting edge guy, I'm not sure where he's located. These came to me from a supplier on eBay in Canada because there are some that are made in Russia that are supposed to be really good. I can't remember the name of them, but they were all out of stock. And so I decided to go with these because I could get them. And I'm glad I did because not only are the parts well made, and again, I spent about 50 bucks on these things. Uh, this is how you do an instruction sheet. This guy not only gives you diagrams of what material needs to be removed, but a good verbal description of what you have to do and even some painting notes. And he talks about, um, you know, like the probe on the inside of the intakes, shows you what it's supposed to look like when it's all said and done. So I, I think like, I think this was definitely um, a good choice on uh, buying a set of seamless intakes. Like I said, can't compare them to anything else because I haven't seen any of the others, but I'm happy with my decision. Anyway, we're almost done here. In addition, I also got this master uh, pitot tube probe, whatever it is, that goes in the nose. And as always, master's miniature turned brass stuff is just outstanding. Uh, last thing is these. This is why I will not be using the slime light decals. Uh, these are made by Furball, which has a pretty good reputation for doing really nice decals. And they make this set for, I think it was like eight bucks, I think, uh, that is just photo etch external detail. Well, not all external details because you've got some canopy rails and frames that I won't be using. But I bought them basically for the slime light frames. These are made for the Zuki Mira kit because it apparently doesn't come with any molded in detail, but I didn't see any reason why I couldn't use it on mine since uh, there's nothing molded in there where they go uh, on this one either. Apparently on the Academy when they're molded in. So anyway, I think those will look good, uh, better than the decals. So there we go, that's it. That's the kit and all of my aftermarket adventures. Okay, quick postscript, because I kind of left uh, this portion of the project, these uh, rivets on the heat shield, um, as if I were gonna go forward with either the aluminum or the plastic discs, and I was. But yesterday afternoon, uh, one of our most gangster members on Scale Modeler's Critique Group, a guy named William Carls, um, <laughs> The dude just does amazing stuff with his tank models. Uh, he's a one of those really talented scratch builders that does stuff that will just blow your mind. Um, anyway, he made a tool like mine and produced some pictures of perfect little annular rivets like this. And um, to give credit where due, another guy had done the same thing, but his tool was a little bit different. It required spinning it because it actually scribed the, the, uh, the, the circle on the outside. But William's tool was exactly like mine and, and that proved to me that it could be done. So I decided to man up and I went back and I put a little bit of uh, super glue inside the end of the tool to make the needle unable to flex and, and therefore stay centered up. And then I uh, chamfered the outside of the tube to make it sharp enough to where it would cut cleanly. And uh, that produced, I think, my best result so far. Good enough that I decided to just run with it. And this is the result. So I think that's pretty good. I think those are nicely aligned and spaced because they are obviously based on what was already molded in. The uh, center hole for the rivet, or what's actually a Phillips head screw, is a little bit deep, but I think I will just take a tiny drop of, uh, I don't know, future or paint or something and, and put in there uh, to where it doesn't look like quite as, as deep of a hole. So anyway, I'm pretty stoked because this has been one of the parts of this project that I've been dreading the most because I just didn't feel like I had a handle on a good solution. So there you go. That's the power of community right there.
Okay, so there you go. That is the rundown on the Hasegawa F4E project that I'm working on. Um, hopefully that gives you guys a pretty good idea of what the possibilities are in terms of uh, everything from just building it straight out of the box to going whole hog with everything available from the aftermarket from this kit, which there is a lot of cool stuff. I feel like I kind of barely scratched the surface um, in terms of, of what's actually available. There are other suppliers of resin besides Ares, um, but I, it seems like they have maybe the best reputation for good detail and, um, and maybe the worst reputation for fit. Um, but I'm only speaking to my experience right here with this stuff. So anyway, um, I will present uh, part two of this two-part thing uh, with the finished project um, when I get there. And <laughs> based on the way this adventure has gone so far, because um, this pile of work I've done so far is really has been a lot of effort, even for what may look like very little progress, but it's occupied a lot of time, and I'm taking my time on this one. I want I want it to be good, so um, I may not produce the finished result until sometime um, in 2018. So if it is, you know, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Uh, I've put way too much money and energy into it already to uh, to rush it. Anyway, enough blabbing. Hope you hope you guys liked it. Hope you found it informative and useful as always. And I definitely appreciate you watching. Much love.